technology and pharmacological sciences. And I'm also director of our Office for Women's Careers in the Office of Gender Equity. A couple of housekeeping comments to start with. As you just heard, today's session will be recorded and available on our Office of Gender Equity website, along with the earlier talks in this Amplifying Equity series. During Dr. Finn's talk today, feel free to put your questions into the chat and I'll be happy to ask them. We will also open up for live questions to Dr. Finn at the end of her talk. To give you some background for today's session, for the last few years, I have had the honor to be the part, part of the faculty for an extraordinary two-day workshop that's aimed at early career scientists and physicians and is sponsored by the Society for Immunotherapy and Cancer. This is an example of a time when I said yes and really benefited. As you might expect, many really important topics were covered and are covered and a lot of wisdom is shared. And one of the best talks in these, this two-day session was called How to Say No by Professor Olya Finn. Since I do not know anyone who has not faced this dilemma, should I say yes or should I say no, I was thrilled when Dr. Finn agreed to share her wisdom with us on this topic. So who is Dr. Finn besides being a wise woman? She's University of Prof of Pittsburgh Distinguished Professor of Immunology and Surgery. She's also the founding chair of the Department of Immunology there. She did her PhD and postdoctoral studies at Stanford University, moved to Duke as faculty, and then Pittsburgh was lucky enough to recruit her. She's a leader in basic and applied research on tumor antigens and cancer vaccines, something that's taking uh, us all forward in a very exciting way. She has served and currently serves on NCI study sections, was a member of the NCI Board of Scientific Counselors, a member of the American Association of Immunologists, for whom she's also served as president. She's held many leadership positions in other immunology and cancer-focused organizations and has won numerous awards, including the AAI Lifetime Achievement Award, the NCI's Outstanding Investigator Award, the AACI Lloyd Old Cancer Immunology Prize, and many more, and was inducted into the inaugural class of the AAI Distinguished Fellows. Her leadership at Pittsburgh of the Women's Task Force there has been extremely effective in supporting the advancement of women in the medical school. I am delighted to welcome Professor Olya Finn, who will keep help us learn how to say no. Olya, it's all yours now. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you all. Uh, I see the numbers going up for, for attending. Uh, as, uh, as Sandy said, um, there are so, so many other competing things, I'm sure, that you have for today. Um, but uh, just, you know, it's a very nice introduction, but it also tells you that I said a lot of yeses <laughs> throughout my career. So I, I do remember uh, thinking, in preparing this talk for the the, uh, in, the Leadership Institute of the, of the Women in, in Cancer Immunotherapy group that Sandy mentioned, then I'm not sure I'm really the right person to give this talk. But uh, as I was uh, you know, giving these talks uh, repeatedly to the junior faculty, um, I learned myself um, where I should have said no if I said, had said yes and, and vice versa. And some of that I'm going to share with you today because I'm sure we're all dealing with the same uh, issues. Um, but I should also say that um, uh, I met Sandy when she was here in Pittsburgh. And that, Sandy, I don't remember, that was way before the Wien Institute. Uh, yeah. And it was for the, uh, the medical students, uh, I think organized uh, uh, sort of career day and, uh, and Sandy came to talk about uh, issues that will face them. Uh, and I was just blown away. So as soon as uh, I was asked to organize this Win Institute uh, with with some other colleagues of mine, she was really the first person I I named on the on the speakers list. So um, 
Uh, and it was more, it was really because I loved what she had to say and I continued to learn uh, as she presents at this institute. Uh, but I also found a way that, you know, to see her once a year at least. <laughs> so that was really great. And this is why I'm also really sorry that I'm doing this uh, online, but it really is helpful um, because to come and visit you it would have taken another few months uh, trying to schedule it. And um, so uh, better, better this than, than nothing. Um, uh, but I will, I promise Andy, that next time I find myself in New York, I'd like to come and visit and maybe a few of us can have lunch together. I have some old friends there uh, that, that I would really love to see again. So um, the art of saying no, and it really is an art because it is much easier to say yes uh, and then regret it. But at the moment, you don't have to explain, you don't have to come up, but, uh, but we have to... Uh, as I said in the little blurb that Sandy put on the on the pamphlet, um, it, the only way to say yes to important things is to have time. And if you keep saying yes to everything, um, you will not have time. You don't have time, time to devote to uh, some of the more important things to you, to your career, to your life. So, um, and and uh, uh, and we all know a lot of people who always say no, and we don't respect them very much. So one of the reasons I'm very interested in this issue and con continuously you know, add things to the talk and subtract from the talk is that um, uh, I am basically the person who believes in one principle and that is good citizenship. And I'm sure that a lot of you do too. So whatever organization I'm in, I want to be a good citizen. And being a good citizen really means you know, caring your own weight and helping the institution uh, succeed. So if you're a good citizen, you're going to be asked to do a lot of things. And if you're a good citizen, you're going to be really tempted to say yes to a lot of things. So how do we organize our lives? Because there's only 24 hours in a day and we have so much to do. And so much to do is uh, uh, really, uh, so I'm talking to an academic institution when we, we talk to the Participants in the Leadership Institute, they are from all, they're from academia, they're from hospitals, they're from, from um, uh, industry. A lot of them come from industry. But we, I'm talking to an academic group. And there, as you know, the competing responsibilities are really demanding. And uh, so you have your research. And that is an unending. I mean, you, you take it home, you wake up with it in, on, your, on your mind. So there are projects, there are research grants, there are manuscripts, scientific meetings. You could fill up 100% of your time just paying attention to your research, which is, you know, we all in the research institutions, which is very important. But of course, you are at a school. So teaching and training, incredibly important. Um, the, uh, the, the didactic teaching, the courses, the lectures, the students, the student related committees, the training grants uh, that we all participate in, some of us write them and, and get them. Um, and then, you know, just the, the just the mentoring itself, not only of your students, but other students, that also takes a lot of time, but it is part of our job. Um, and then the service is really what I talked about in terms of citizenship. Uh, we can't run a school without or department uh, or university without actually organized committees that have specific tasks. So you you ask all the time to uh, to do service by by being a member of these committees, and 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 just by running your own lab, you do administration. But then you know usually in the program you're part of the division, uh, you know department center. You're going to have administrative responsibilities, and that is all local. And, and, you know, Sandy was introducing me and talked about AAI and AACR, et cetera, and, 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 and CI, we are called upon to help not only locally uh, maintain the quality and, and success of our institutions, but also of our larger community. So, and all of it is, uh, you know, unfunded, unpaid, grant reviews, editorial boards, advisory committees, professional societies, very important for ourselves uh, to have a community that supports our efforts and our mission, and certainly for the new generation of, uh, of scientists, new generation of academics that we want to bring up into the community. Um, and then of course, you know, uh, it's important that some of us 
our science that's translated, our friend science is translated um, into, you know, drugs and, and products and uh, that, that we help the companies develop properly uh, things that, they, that we do research. And so there's a lot of consulting and some of it is paid. So, you know, again, just looking at this slide makes me tired, <laughs> but, uh, but all of us are called upon to. So how do you look at all this, fit it all in, or even prioritize it? Because if I look at research, teaching, service, administration, uh, and these unpaid professional activities, they're almost all equally important. So, you know, how do we prioritize it? And not only are we in that situation, but on top of all this, we all have a personal life. Right, we all have partners, we all have parents, we all have siblings, we all have children, and so you know, who may or may not understand these demands on our lives. And uh, I mean, I my favorite uh, memory is not so favorite, but my one memory is of my children when they were small uh, on a Friday night saying, "Mommy, can we go to the zoo this weekend? Or are you writing a grant?" and this was a, and they were too young to know what a grant is, what a grant was, but they heard me say it so many times because Saturday and Sunday was usually, mommy went to, you know, either to work or was downstairs in the room writing a grant. So, you know, this, and, and uh, uh, Sandy shows this, this cartoon and she and I simultaneously chose it out of the New Yorker, uh, this, you know, juggling all the time and uh uh it is that you know the the demands are both of men and women but i think we have to really admit still that the it's still the greater demand on women to to perform at the level uh and we usually do at the higher level at the level of uh, of our male colleagues and we still no matter how <clears throat> forward looking they are uh especially the younger generation we still take a lot more responsibility for the families and for, you know, be it children or be it aging parents or um, ill friends or whatever. So, uh, so it's a constant juggling, juggling act. And of course, I mean, nothing, nothing brought this uh, up to the fore um, as the pandemic, because all of these things uh, that we sort of managed uh, uh, showed us that, you know, during the pandemic, that we are really sort of at the at the at the you know breaking point with taking the responsibilities for all of this. And uh, I you know uh, I was in a very privileged situation during the pandemic where my children are grown. they you know the grandchildren are okay. They're also grown. My um, you know the family was in a, in a good, good shape. That I can even you know staying home. I could still do some work, but I felt so badly from our junior faculty and especially our junior women. Um, we had, you know, online faculty meetings, we had seminars and the children were there and uh, you can't really concentrate and, but that's, that's how it is. And so, so with all of these things, we also have to acknowledge the fact that our society, especially when it comes to women is uh, who, are who have taken all these responsibilities professionally, our society is still not prepared to fully support those activities by fully supporting families um, and uh, childcare. And, and this is an issue that we are constantly uh, fighting for. Um, and, and we have a similar work, a women's group that you, you do. And in fact, I was thinking that as we have a discussion later on, we should plan some joint activities because some of these uh, online uh, meetings and seminars, I think we can even do together. So we can talk about that later. But in any event, um, it really pains me when I when we have uh, the meetings to see that my very junior faculty colleagues, you know, beginning assistant professors are still struggling with exactly the same issues and exactly the same problems, exactly unsolved problems that I struggled with when I was an assistant professor. And then I worked on changing things, you know, for the last 30 some years, and they still have the same problem. So I feel so much a failure. So, you know, we can discuss these things and we can give them advice, but really uh, the society has to step up a little bit more to help um, the newer generation uh, be good citizens, but also be able to take care of their family responsibilities. So that's just uh, sort of parenthetic. 
But so when we are doing this in person, I ask a question. I will just, uh, this is going to be more a rhetorical question, but um, so I ask a question, how many times in the last three years did you say no to your mentor, department chair, dean, because you had too much work? Once, twice, many times. When we're in person, one or two hands go up out of maybe you know 65 so or so women in the audience. I think that uh, I can imagine that very few of the hands would go up um, from this group that I can't see at the moment. But then the other question is how many times in the last three years did you say no to your partner, your spouse, your friend, your child, because you were too busy at work? And I would imagine that all of you are going to uh, raise your hand and it probably is going to be a C. Uh, answer many times. So is this the right priority? And, and you know, is it, is it, you know, so why is it so easy for us to say no to family, to friends, and we don't know how to say no uh, to some of the work responsibilities. So this is something to, um, to think about and see if you can sort of balance this out a little bit in your own life. Sandy sent me this the other day. And Sandy, you know, I am a devotee of, of uh, New Yorker cartoons. In fact, if you look at, um, at some of my reviews, the only figure in the review is a New Yorker cartoon, which I bought <laughs> for that review. Um, and uh, so I'm looking at this one. Um, you sent it to me just before I had the chance to open my new uh, New Yorker. And I am looking at it, and it, it, it isn't really what you know, it's interesting that that the cartoonist and you know, which they reflect sort of the general uh, uh, public. Everybody is actually struggling with the same thing. But you also mentioned to me, Sandy, that um, that uh, people are worried that 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 uh, more general population is getting a little bit too comfortable saying no, and that people are saying no to too many things. And that as a society, we might actually suffer because it's this sort of sort of the great resignation, but in a different way. You know, I really don't have to do this. Uh, so this uh, is, is uh, I'm not sure where the cartoonist stands on this, but it's an interesting question to ponder. And I want to go back to my comments about uh, my uh, devotion to citizenship. So again, whether we are in our institutions or whether we're in general society that the, the cartoonist is trying to represent here, um, we still have to, to know what to say no to and what we shouldn't say no to in order to make the society work. Um, so how do we decide? So one of the things that, um, this, is, this comes from uh, 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 the Inner Chimp <laughs> the article uh, from 2018, uh, if you're interested, uh, it's an interesting article, but one very important point that it makes is that um, uh, most of the time we really do suffer from, you know, being too responsible and we're always talking about what we should do. And it can be helpful to reflect things we should not do. And so uh, how do we do that? Uh, for one thing, most of us commit to things too easily. And I've in, in the later in the talk, I have some important examples to give you of my own uh, mistakes in that uh, in that uh, uh, area. And then, more importantly, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should always do something, uh, and uh, we should do it. Uh, I, for example, uh, you know, know that I can organize something in the department and I can do it well, and. Uh, but if I stop to think, there's probably another five or six people who can do it. So should I say yes or should I say, okay, let's see, six of us can do this. Who is actually most available at the moment? Um, so yes, I can do it, but you know, should I do it? Now, some tasks are unavoidable, right? And this is the professional citizenship. So you know, I mean, there are some things that even if they come, they come at the wrong time, um, you'll just decide to do it. And I'll give you some examples of that. Um, but it's very important that we recognize that some requests are discretionary, right? So uh, so not unavoidable. Uh, and so, you know, if you ask to participate in a new project, it would be very interesting, right? There's some new people you can work with. It may come up, you know, a new grant can, 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 can come up out of it, but is your plate full? If it is, even though it 
and it's a new project, you will not hurt it by not participating, basically. So that's, you know, being a good citizen can't take anything new, but you're not abandoning it. <clears throat> um, and you know how many times all of us get uh, asked to contribute to a volume, a book, speak at a conference, give a seminar at another university, give a luncheon seminar to a women's group, <laughs> right? Um, uh, be an external examiner on, a, on, a, on an exam, do reviews, write references, organize conferences, be on a committee. And uh, so again, uh, these are all discretionary, but a lot of them you will want to do. So again, how do you decide? Um, and so I, I, this is an example that I give everybody. And it is something that I, I have, that the way I made myself learn how to decide is, um, uh, and I've been doing this since 1985, is this little book that was a tongue in cheek kind of uh, a book, um, Leadership Secrets of Attila the Hun. And it was something that was given to, you know, to friends as, as Christmas presents. It came out just around Christmas time. And it was, you know, talked about at, a, at dinner tables, you know, just because it had some very funny and tongue in cheek things, but it had one uh, thing that I've just stayed with. And it says, never write anything that a king won't read. And what this really means as you, probably all you know uh, can can uh, figure out is that um, don't do anything that isn't the most important at the moment for you or for somebody else and uh, I have to say that I've shown this a few times and this time uh, in Seattle at the at the leadership institute I got uh, hackled on this because they say we're all queens here you're talking about a king so so uh, I'm doing this because it's straight out of the book. But of course, if your king is your queen, please do uh, take it as never write anything that a queen won't read. So, um, so here is taking this principle from 1985. I looked at all the stuff that I, I agreed to do between 1987 and 2019 here. And, uh, uh, and I can't even tell you from 2019 to today how many more things I took on that I shouldn't have probably. But in any, in any event, there, was, there are things there, uh, like asked to be the director of the immunology pro program at the Pittsburgh Cancer Institute, sure, you know, that is something that a king will notice. And a king can be the cancer center director, king can, your king can be uh, your provost, your king can be the dean of the School of Medicine, the senior vice chancellor for health sciences, whoever your king is. They can also be your colleagues, your immunologists, like it was in my case. I could have said no, but there were a handful of immunologists really eager to get together and put some, some programs in place. And so they were my kings at the time, and I said yes. Uh, same with the immunology training program. But for example, the member of the space committee, you know, I, I probably didn't need to do that. There's a, a member uh, that was a, so if you're a, a member of the search committee for the senior vice chancellor for health sciences, this is a person who is going to decide uh, what the, the environment where I work for the rest of the time I would be here uh, is going to be chosen. So, so if I want to make sure that the right person is chosen, that I can see the right person, then I better be on that search committee. That took so much time, I can't tell you. And in fact, the first search committee failed and we had to set up a second search committee um, and took another year. But in any event, this is something that I you know, thought was an appro appropriate thing too. But again, co-chair of the School of Medicine Committee for Space Utilization, that was a total waste of my time. It was you know, good citizenship, but everybody could have done this, right? And somehow I, I was the first one to say yes, and I shouldn't have. Um, again, um, many, many things here that, uh, uh, and so one thing I also want to point out here is that some committees, and you could you know, make this decisions that way too, some committees are for four years or three years, or it's just one year because it's a search committee for something. It's very nice to know that you will get on the committee, you will do your job and you'll uh, get off and then do something else. But something like this, for example, 
started in 2009. As far as I know, I'm still a member of that committee. 2002 to present research executive committee. So there are some things that you really that have to really look at what you're doing and actively get yourself removed. Uh, say I've done my job. You you know you're not going to upset anybody to say by saying I don't want to be here the the 21st year <laughs> of of uh, committee membership. So um, so again. Um, it's I think it's very important at any time in in our careers to sort of take a look back and and remember what what were the things that we really that we said yes to that we really confirm it was an appropriate thing to say yes to and what should we have said no to because that really is helpful going forward and probably at my stage in my career I can just look at this and acknowledge my mistakes. Uh, and hope that somebody else will benefit from them rather because too late for me to benefit from them. But I think it's probably very good for younger faculty, especially let's say, you know, at the, at the transfer transition from assistant professor, to associate professor, there are certain things that you have to do at certain stages in your career. But as you take that next step, look back and divest yourself from the responsibilities that are not any more compatible with, you know, with, your stage of the career and um, and uh, you know where you are going. Let's see. So so the most important thing then it'll it'll allow you to have the basis on which you can make a decision and it'll allow you that you know. So the important thing is to think before saying yes. But the process of thinking uh, about it is really to to have some previous experience and previous basis, like I just showed, so that you know what your thinking is based on. And of course, you know, is this the right thing for you to do at this stage in your career? It's a different story when you are just a starting assistant professor, just a starting postdoc in the lab, et cetera. Then if you are, you know, at my stage of the career, or if you are, you know, a tenured professor, et cetera, how many times you can say yes and how many times you can say no. And uh, so sometimes saying more yeses than noes will be beneficial for your career. And you need to think about that. Um, I think probably the best way to decide uh, that helps not only you, but also uh, your group uh, and your institution and your environment is, are you the best person to do this? Because people don't think about that as much uh, that, you know, sometimes they ask you to do it because you just walked by your office and you were in it. And they may have been going to another office to ask somebody else, but they saw you, right? So and they know you're the nice person who might say yes. So they'll they cut their job short. So are you the best person to do this? And probably uh, the easiest way to say no is to, to point out that you are not the best person to do this, not because you don't want to do it, not because you would rather do something else, which you might, but in that case, um, you know, you might suggest other people who are either just as good or even better than you for doing that. And you would do it, you are basically doing this to do a favor to the task that is that you're being asked to do. Um, the other thing is, you know, can the task be adapted to your schedule? Uh, you know, I look at my calendar and if something, you know, is just coming in between two things that I have to do and I won't have enough time to do it, it is not adaptable to my schedule. That's another way to make a decision and actually give a fairly understandable reason why you can't do it. And of course, will the king read it? So if I decide that the king will read what I did, um, then none of these things above actually are as important to me. I will find a way to put it into my schedule. I will find a way to be the best person to do this by learning how to do something. And you know, probably it's a good thing for my career because the king would read it. So again, in my mind, you know, it's the king and the queens that, that the kings and the queens that really in the end decide how important will it be for you to take something on or, or how easy it will be for you to say no. So <clears throat> here's a, so so these are the rules. Yeah. Is it the right to say your career? Are the best person to do this? Can the task be adapted to your schedule when the king read it? So this is a very, uh, this is from, from Monday, <clears throat> a request that came to me. And I want to show you, you know, I just gave you these rules, but I want to show you, you know, 
how well I did this week with my own rules and have you decide. So this is a young uh, investigator from China, a wonderful young woman from the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's not a problem if I you know, um, identify her in this way. She was, she trained with a good colleague of mine in France with Laurence Gitforger and, and, uh, and uh, towards the end of her training in Paris, she had multiple offers, job offers, one of them in Tsuzhou. And I served in, a, in many ways as her sort of unofficial mentor, uh, advising her because I know the Chinese community, I've worked with them. Uh, scientific community, and uh, and I knew a lot of people who had something to say about the offer and uh, of a job. So so she came to rely on me at least initially in her in her career. And so she was she sent me this um, um, on Monday, and she said that, that uh, her manuscript uh, uh, arsenic trioxide eliciting prophylactic and therapeutic immune responses against solid tumors was accepted in this particular journal uh, with a high impact factor. Um, it was chosen for the cover story. And uh, she wanted to know if, uh, if I could contribute a research highlight, about a thousand words, standard for the max, for the journal. And, and the, so and on, you know, to go at the same time uh, when her paper is published. So I was very excited about her uh, having this paper. Uh, clearly, she was proud of it. And uh, without thinking very much and very long, I said, congratulations, I would be happy to write the research highlight. But then I had to say, so it very much depends on the deadline. I have carefully planned every minute in the next two weeks. I'm thinking, when do they need this? Uh, I have grand deadlines, overlapping activities related to the 20th anniversary of our department that I'm organizing. And from December 17 to 28, my husband and I are on vacation on a cruise ship. So I wasn't going to write a review on a cruise ship. So that, uh, so I said, depending on the journal deadline, I will see if I can squeeze this in between my deadlines and December 17. So I'm really, you know, can it be adapted to my schedule? It was really going to be tough, but I love this person. And, uh, uh, and I'm very appreciative of her talents and I was going to do whatever I could. Okay. So... Keep that in mind because I will get back to this. So this is this was you know uh, one thing that that um, you know. So you saw the request and you saw my reply. Is this the right stage for my career? It doesn't matter anymore. The world is not waiting to get all your Finn's research highlights. So we'll do nothing for my career, but I'm hoping it'll do something for her. Am I the best person to do this? I didn't know at the time. I said yes immediately because I was the best person because I mentored her. I didn't really even look at, and, and the paper seemed like it was along my research interests. So I figured, okay, you know, clearly didn't think about that. Uh, can it be adapted to my schedule? It was going to be squeezed in with a shoehorn, right? And will the king read it? Not in the, not in a million years. It doesn't matter to me, you know, the, the, anymore. So none of these rules really apply either that other than that I really like that person, I was gonna do something. So keep that in mind, I'll get back to it. Um, but I could have said no, right? So if you have to say no, even if it's somebody you love, somebody you respect, uh, you'll have to say no at some point. So um, it's how you say no. Like everything else we do is never what we do, it's how we do it because so, you know, how you say no is really important. So nicely, and you state the reason without being apologetic, because if you start to apologize too much, you're actually not even believable. Um, you can recommend somebody else. And usually I, I recommend my trainees or at least three other women who can do as good a job as I. So if it's something important and I can't do, I recommend other women. If it's something, is, I, I stay away from recommending things that are just tasks, but if it's something important. So here, you know, I didn't even look at that and ask for a repeat invitation that can use your help in the future. Again, very important to say, I can't do it now. I'll do it. I could have said to her, you know, next time, <laughs> let me know when you're writing an article and I will schedule it or something like that. But I didn't say that. However, I would like to, to have you 
think about these things because I think they're very important. Uh, we can we can not do a task, and if it's something important and we really can do it, we can promote other people by having suggesting them uh, to do it. Um, and it's very important to uh, to do that. So so here's here's an example of of my doing just that actually. Um, so this is um, this is from my study section. And it says, uh, you know, that was last year uh, and my study section ends, in, I'm, I'm on it for four years and I end in June. So this was last year where I had still one year left. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, thanks for doing the June mini while on vacation in Italy. It already tells you that, you know, I was trying to squeeze a lot of, a lot of things in. Uh, so I was on vacation and I had study section. But, uh, you know, it was my commitment three years before for that. So I, I squeezed it in. So as you may, may know, we nominate new chairperson for a study section every two years. And our current chair will retire next year in June. So that's the, that's, the, that's the time when I get off study section, right, this June. The nomination process usually starts in the fall, around September. But I'd like to communicate this to potential nominees early so I would have a good candidate to proceed with, with for the approval. So I think you would make a great chair given your excellent review work and co-chairing as I experienced from the last three rounds. While considering the nomination, I also recognize your busy schedule and the need of your commitment to an extended year. So I would have to extend for one more year, right? Um, as chair, you would have a high responsibility for the panel meeting and there will be formal chair training session. It's a big commitment, but there is also an added benefit of getting a reduced review load, usually five assignments each round. Please take some time to consider and let me know if you're willing to make such a commitment. I'd be happy to talk to you if you have any questions or concerns before making a decision. Okay, now looking at this invitation, it's an honor and uh, it's not gonna do much for my career because here I am, but the king will read it. So, you know, it's, you know, the dean, the chair, the, you know, I'm, I'm chair of study section. It does something good for the department, et cetera. But, I really couldn't extend it for another year. Uh, I really, you know, I had, I, had, I had already made plans what I was going to do instead of study section after I get off, right? So take another responsibilities. So I thought, I, and I took some time to think about it. So I took at least a week or more. So this is now I responded. So I said, first of all, I want to thank you for the honor of the invitation to chair the study section. Had it come a few years ago, I would have accepted it without any problems. So my stage of the career would have been different. However, at this point in my life, career, retirement plans, not certain, et cetera, the prudent thing is to decline and leave myself less encumbered. However, I do want to see a woman chair the study section. So I hope you will consider another woman. Happy to discuss some possibilities with you if that is allowed. Just as an example, I think so-and-so is terrific highly knowledgeable and very thoughtful and could derive career benefits from being a study session chair. I will always be happy to continue to co-chair any of the meetings while I'm still a member. So the rules, right? Um, you can't do it. You gave a really, if this is a reasonable no, because I, I couldn't tell her that I'm still being, you know, active in a, for another year, et cetera. But I didn't miss an opportunity to, you know, I thought, Having a chair for that study section was good. And, and by saying no, I was going to re reduce that possibility, right? So I, I, I do that. And, and to show you how it was taken, um, thanks very much for your reply. I'm sure you're swamped with emails after vacation. I really appreciate your candid answer and your thoughts about the so-and-so chair role. I fully understand your position. It's true that a woman chair is much desirable now, yes. This woman is a terrific review, and I will discuss with my chief on the chair nomination, given the many factors that are being considered. I'll let you know when I need some feedback. Good news is that you still have two more years to serve. So I'll need your help as co-chair at some round. Thanks and best wishes for the remaining summer. All right, so say it nicely. State the reason without being apologetic. Recommend other women. Ask for a repeat invitation or other things that you can do instead, right? So, okay. Back to, uh, this is not working. Okay, another example. Uh, so here's, here's something that I, you know, the chair of the study section, I would have liked to have done it truly. And 10 years before, even five years ago, I may have said yes, right? 
this I wouldn't have done ever, <laughs> okay? But I couldn't just say, forget it. Not, uh, so, dear audio, you've been nominated to serve on the Institutional Conflict of Interest Committee, which was empowered by Pitt's newest policy. The, the Conflict of Interest Committee will review major university transactions and the outside engagements of its senior officials. The committee will formulate management plans to assure that these transactions and engagements do not bias the university's core missions of education, scholarship, and research. I don't expect the workload for this new committee to be excessive, which was clearly a lie. Likely a single two-hour meeting per month. Great. The meetings will be virtual. Bill. Okay. The last thing I wanted to do is, you know, oversee my colleagues as to uh, their conflict of interest. I think lawyers should do that. And, uh, and then that, you know, a single two hour meeting per month for which you have to, you know, review these conflicts, right? That, that wasn't taken into consideration. Again, I couldn't really just say, or I, you know, some people would not even respond, but again, the bill, I, I, I waited a little bit. I sort of kind of forgot to respond, but I don't believe I answered this email. It's been a strange month. I segued from COVID to a family vacation and I'm still on. I'm unable to take this on due to multiple other activities that have totally overextended me. I'm currently in the process of stepping down from committees rather than joining new ones. Thank you for thinking of me, best regards. Again, not too apologetic, kind of straight. And you notice I, didn't rec I did not recommend any women <laughs> here. <laughs> I think that's, you know, that would be, if I had an enemy in this institution, and fortunately I don't have, I would recommend, I would have recommended them. Okay. So this is another important thing. Okay. You will make a mistake sometime and you will say yes. And then you will think about it and you will reconsider. And now what, you know, how do you do that without really, you know, burning bridges, making people angry. So so you consider the opportunity cost, you know, if, is it, uh, you know, it, do, do you continue to do it so that you don't have to say no? Is it worth the sacrifice? So it's just personal. Does it outweigh the benefits? Does it have an impact on your personal life, your current projects? If it does that, it's not the opportunity, it costs too much, right? Um, now, instead of thinking uh, that, you know, I will, it'll, they consider me irresponsible if I now step down from something I said I would do and step, step away. You think about it differently. Uh, it would be irresponsible to stay, to agree and really not do the work because a lot of people do that. A lot of people will, will say yes to something and they'll end up on their CV, but in terms of the work, other people will be doing it. Diplomatic, but truthful. Short explanation, justification, make sure to preserve the relationship. We all work very hard and we don't need to be abused by other people, right? So preserve the relationship, take the responsibility, express gratitude, end on a positive note, you know, the people, and so that people still love you because it's important we all work together. Don't give them problems by stepping down. You step down from, a, from a, this is responsibility and provide solutions. So offer an alternative a different timeline, maybe you can do it under different circumstances. Another colleague who might be eager to step in. I mean, we have a lot of people who are who would like to be on certain important committees and then we older ones get called, but just, you know, give up, and if it's a good opportunity, you just can't do it, give it to somebody else or suggest somebody else. And most importantly, no matter what stage of your career you're in, learn from it. Don't make it a habit to say yes and then have it to, to renege. Don't be that kind of person. Uh, and learn somehow to agree only to, to things that excite you and that you actually have room for. So let's go back to my request from you, Ting, right? You remember, I love her. I want to do it. She requested it. She was so happy to tell me she published the paper and can I please do this? And I said, I will do that. And then I read the paper. Okay. So, and I read it thoroughly and it's a wonderful paper, but it is so far from what I do that to write a thousand words in the research highlights, I would have to actually do research into this area because this was not, this was not a vaccine paper. This was, this was a cell death mechanism of cell death paper, cell death induced by 
various drugs and they have a candidate drug. And that whole cell death process can provoke an immune response to cancer. So that I'm, I am an expert on that last bit, but I have no idea whether the paper, I, I have to assume that paper is wonderful, it's been reviewed, but I cannot place it in the research highlight in a field, I wouldn't even know what references to, to give. So I thought I got myself into a lot of trouble. So my reply after I took the time to think, right? <clears throat> so I sent it to her and I copied the editor who in the meantime has immediately sent me the, the, the rules and the, you know, the format and all that and where I should upload the review. So this is just, this is now on the 30th. So this is two days later. And uh, uh, they thought they were all done uh, recruiting the research highlight writer. But I said, I just finished reading your manuscript and I have second thoughts about my suitability for writing the research highlights. This is really not the vaccine in the sense that I have been developing vaccines. It's a wonderful paper, but the field that I need to place within to place it within in the research highlight is not as familiar to me as the standard vaccine field. This is more suitable for Lorenzo Guido, so suggested to other people, or others who have been leaders in the field of drug induced tumor immunogenesis and in view of vaccination. I'm also not familiar with the field of cell death. That's another very different set of studies that I would have to find, read, and reference in the research highlights text. It would not take me too much time to write 1500 words for true vaccine paper. This, however, will take a lot more time, which I don't have, and I would not even be sure that I'm referencing the right literature. Have you asked others, such as those two? I'm sure you know people who are much closer to the subject of your manuscript than I am. I don't even have the right vocabulary to comment on your interpretation of your results. I'm sorry, I should have read the whole paper first before I agreed to it. I'm copying the editor who sent me the formal invitation so that we can resolve this together. <clears throat> Outcome? It's an okay outcome. I have not heard from you, Ting, yet, but I heard from the editor right, right away. The, Dr. Finn, thank you for your kind response. It's really a pity we lost the paper from your great team. Hope we could invite you again in the future. I will contact Dr. Ma and, assistant her, and assist her to find some other person to make comment. Best regards, gang. Okay, so I still don't know the full outcome. It might take her some time to recover from this. Uh, you know, I'll try to send other messages when, when I hear from her. But, but I think I sort of followed these rules. I, uh, I was diplomatic, but truthful. Uh, I'm hoping to preserve the relationship. Certainly with the editor I did, but he's not the one who's important to me. I offered an alternative and I certainly learned from it. Take two days. You know, don't say yes right away. But to, to say that um, it is not easy to always know, and, and, but it's also never um, the final decision. You know, th there's a, a way to uh, say no after saying yes. And I think that's all I have for you. Uh, and we can, uh, uh, what I really like uh, is to, um, uh, hear other people's examples or you know uh, I don't know what sort of questions I you know I'm not I'm not a, an expert I'm just this is just personal experiences but I would really very much like to to um, hear from you and I think something's in the chat Carol <laughs> thanks Carol <laughs> uh, so this has been wonderful and thank you for being so very candid and giving us such clear-cut examples of when you were able to restore uh, your, your thinking. And so we're open, we don't have a lot of time left, but please uh, raise your hand and, and Ugo or I can uh, unmute you, or I think you may even be able to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, if you have some questions for Dr. Finn, uh, she'd be happy to answer them or maybe give examples of where you have had to rethink some of this or you're about to do it and you don't know how. <laughs> well, I can just tell you that I uh, was- Margaret was, had her hand up. Go oh. ahead, Carol. Oh, hi. Thanks so hi. much, Dr. Finn, uh, for, for an amazing talk. Uh, you know, as I feel like when we're junior, as you said, we struggle more with the no. 
because you don't want to fall off the list completely. Right. And, and again, this sort of citizenship thing. So um, I think, you know, you're, you're just, it's really just a comment, um, you know, your way of sort of addressing those, no, like put, putting sort of rubrics on it and saying, okay, you know what, this is, this is how I can think about this. It's not just emotional. Let yeah. me just really kind of take the emotion out of there. I mean, it's there, but kind of have a more um, rigorous way of, of and, and rational way of thinking about it and then, and then be nice. <laughs> and hopefully you don't fall off the list. So right. thanks so right. much. Yeah, you know, we, I have a, uh, a colleague here, Tulia Bruno, she comes to the, uh, she was, a, she was a, um, she's an alumna from the, of the Leadership Institute, now she's faculty, but <clears throat> she uh, says yes a lot. <laughs> and so I took it on myself to, when I hear her say yes, to immediately text her and say, stop doing that. <laughs> so, so, so she now says yes and looks at me because I am worried when, when you're early in your career, you can be popular because you're doing everything, but you spread yourself too thin and your research will suffer and your papers will suffer. And you know, one thing that you, when you say yes to something that involves many people, you don't want to let them down. So the only person you let down is yourself because, okay, my paper can wait. I'll go to this, you know, I'll do this thing. I, you know, admissions or whatever that I joined. So the balance has to be, you have to say many more yeses, I know, uh, but, the, but the balance has to be also, the, is it interfering with the only thing they're actually going to look at when you come up for tenure is your, your research productivity, your papers, and, you know, I mean, people will be friendly, but the, the record will be uh, your research and your papers. So that's one thing you can't, can't interfere with. Yeah. And I think the point that you make about stages in one's career, it's critical. There are times to say yes to things that are really crucial for where you are, will put you in contact with other people, and you can do, and you can do it without uh, in any way uh, diminishing where you know that your primary responsibilities are. I've just had uh, an opportunity. I was asked to be part of a National Academy a uh, year and a half study uh, that's going to come out with recommendations about how we can support caregivers, especially how the pandemic has taken an uneven toll of um, women and minorities who are junior faculty. And I had to think about it because it's a major commitment, but it's a tremendous honor and an opportunity to perhaps have a real uh, impact. And so as a result, I am discarding at least one other thing that would yeah. be part of my portfolio because I think that this is worth the, the trade-off. And I think the king will definitely read it. Yes, yes. One thing I, I know there's another question. I wanted to say is um, when you're very junior um, uh, and it's, it's also not a bad idea to talk to the king when you ask to do something, you know? Uh, or, you know, or to your senior faculty whom you appreciate and, and respect. Say, yeah, I was just asked to do this. You know, go to your department chair. I was just asked if that's your king. I was just asked to do this. Do you think this is good for me to do? And so you get some confirmation of, of your thoughts early in your career. I think it's a good thing. And then the, then the king has actually even heard that they asked you, even if he decides or she, you know, decides, the queen decides that you shouldn't take it. They know that they asked that you were asked. Next Thanks question. So. Yeah, uh, my name is Teen Yu. I'm from the Division of Gastroenterology. I'm, oh, I'm a physician scientist. and I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Finn. This was um, an incredible talk and it's so nice because I think practice makes perfect, hopefully. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I was going to share an example that I think like I, I totally agree with everything that you said. And I was just going to add that um, so I had a recent experience where I'm a physician scientist, and we've been recently asked to cover additional clinical coverage, which is a week at a time, and it was billed as not too, um, not too overtaxing, but I had just completed already an extra week, and I was fresh off of that, and asked to do another one, and um, 
and I, I really just couldn't do it. And so I utilized one extra um, advice that I'd seen on some emails that have give faculty advice on how to say no, which is to have a no committee and it could be ad hoc anyone. So I went home to my husband who's also a physician scientist and said, what do I do about this? And so we discussed it, came up with a plan. Um, we decided that I should actually call the person who was making the schedule, who's a senior faculty member and give him my reasons. And we cut down all the 10,000 reasons I was gonna give to the salient ones, um, which were that I am a research faculty and me giving up a week of my time is very different from person who is primary clinical. Right. And he really heard me out on that. And I also tried to give um, uh, an alternative, which was, could I, if I take that week, because I realize it's important, we need coverage for that, you know, hospital at that time, um, could I then maybe take away some of my um, not as crucial like clinic days, for example. Mm -hmm. And so he he really heard me out and he said, oh, that's actually a good point. The difference between the research and the clinical faculty, we hadn't taken that into consideration. Let me talk to our chief and I'll get back to you. Um, and he got back to me at the end of the day and said, yeah, like, let's do this um, and we'll take this into account for the future. And so I agree with you that it is good to state your reasons and, and maybe it will actually help in the future. <laughs> yeah, and other people just like you. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and it, it goes to show you, it's, you know, people, you know, people are, were not intending to take advantage of you. They right. didn't realize it, they, you know, they were clueless. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's another question here in the chat from Dahlia Riz, which I can read. How do you say I'd love to, but fold it into compensation <laughs> enhancement ah. opportunity. I find we say yes to so many unpaid tasks and need to convert that to financial growth when you consider pay disparities between men and women. Oh, absolutely. Um, so if you remember on one of the slides, I said, these are all unpaid, right? <laughs> A lot of the, uh, um, so in, in fact, Sandy asked me yesterday, uh, we had a little technical um, uh, test test and uh, pre-test and Sandy said, uh, uh, like, send me your information for the honorarium. And, and I said, it's really funny, Sandy, because um, it would have never occurred to me to even think about getting the honorarium. But in, with our women's group, we had had multiple speakers, just like I was speaking to you, come to our, you know, luncheon um, meetings. And, and finally, we went to the cancer center director and said, hey, we need to pay these women and on a regular, this me on a radio, doesn't matter what it, it is, even symbolic, you know. And I said to Sandy, somebody, one of us had to think about it because the women who gave talks never asked if there was an honorarium or a request or said, I, I will do that, but my honorarium is 250 or 500 or whatever, right? And I said, and even going through that experience, I never thought of uh, an honorarium from Mount Sinai. It never even occurred to me. So, so in response to Dahlia's question, um, you know, uh, there's this whole women don't ask, right? Um, we, uh, I don't know whether uh, there's, you know, uh, whether men do it because in our institution, everything, not, there's no transparency whatsoever as to who gets compensated for what. But, and that is the biggest problem. But, um, but I think that if there are too many demands in too many committees, it is something that that the discussion sh should start. Uh, when I chaired the department, uh, and I had very few faculty, and actually uh, we started with five faculty, four women and one man, and and the women were really overwhelmed because uh, this was 2002. Um, you know, we were saying yes to everything that you know just to have the woman on the committee, the woman on the committee, and even if a token woman, we were saying yes because it doesn't matter if you're a token woman, you'll make sure other women follow, right? Because you'll bring them in. So, um, so then I realized uh, that whatever my faculty was doing, a small number to start with, if we quickly grew to like 15, but initially the first couple of years, I realized that, that they, you know, they, what they were doing was very good for our department. You know, they, we were a new department and, the, and their memberships and committees advertised the department, et cetera. So I personally, from the departmental funds, gave uh, a, a bonus at the end of the year for memberships on the committees. Uh, but it, so so at the department level, at your center level, so you, that can be discussed. I did that, I think that disappeared, but, but um, 
I became aware of the fact that uh, that they couldn't say as many no's as they should have because they were really good citizens. It was good for us. And as long as it was good for us, I was going to compensate them. Not very much, but still, even symbolic compensation is really um, important. So now with the uh, faculty evaluation forms that we have that fill out every service counts for something, you know, so, so you don't have to cover all your salary to your grants or whatever, because, you know, if you do 20% service or 5% service, that's a salary cover coverage. So you want to make sure that that actually happens. Sandy, you're muted. Thank you so much, Olga. This has been wonderful. I think that everybody is going to be walking away from here with <laughs> some very good decision points. Uh, developing a no committee, I think, is a nice addition. Yes. And uh, really, this has been great. Uh, and cannot thank you enough for adding to what has been a wonderful series of amplifying equity. We look forward to you visiting Mount Sinai in person and and meeting with up up thank with you. some of us and a lot of the cancer immunology people here. So yeah. thank you again. This has been just great. You're more than welcome. It really was a pleasure. And seeing all your faces is fun. And uh, and I really do want to work on getting us together with our women's task force. We were at that women's task force. We wanted a WTF to be <laughs> to be our name, but they they made us change it to Women's Initiative Task Force. And now now with so. Uh, but I think we, there's a lot that we can share in terms of even presentations and send each other Zoom you know, invitations. That'd be great. Wonderful. Okay. United we stand. Yes, Thank exactly, you. exactly. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye.